right, it's my pleasure to introduce Hannah. She is a pre-veterinary student at Mississippi State University, where she is majoring in wildlife, fisheries, and aquaculture. Her current undergraduate research project under Dr. Michael Sandel involves determining the presence of mycobacterium ulcerans in red drum from the Gulf of Mexico. She plans to apply to veterinary school in the fall to further pursue her goal of becoming a veterinarian. So you can present now, thank you. Thank you so much. So today I'm presenting on mycobacterium ulcerans detection in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And I just wanna acknowledge my co-authors and their collaborating institutions. So um, just to reiterate what Kayla said earlier about mycobacterium ulcerans, that is an ulcerative disease causing bacterial species found in aquatic environments around the globe. Um, and MPM stands for mycolactone producing mycobacteria, and that Beruli ulcer is a neglected tropical disease caused by mycobacterium ulcerans, Ecovar ulcerans. And here again is that map of endemic areas and just what Beruli ulcer looks like. Um, so today I'm going to introduce previous work done on mycobacterium ulcerans in fishes and quantify the relative abundance of mycobacterium ulcerans in freshwater and brackish fish in the southeastern United States and marine fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, identify the association of mycobacterium ulcerans within fish communities and a phylogenetic analysis of the plasmids. So mycobacterium ulcerans ecovar pseudoshotsii was determined to be the causative agent of skin lesions in striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay. And following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, there were anecdotal reports of fish with increased skin lesions. And here on that map on the bottom, you can see the red and blue are fish found with skin lesions and their proximity to the oil spill. And on the right are the groups of species that were sampled in the project. And this project found a positive correlation with elevated skin lesions and um, elevated concentrations of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon concentration um, from the oil spill. But this study only found that there was a positive correlation where this study found that the dispersed crude oil changes the external microbiome of fishes and induces dysbiosis, which if you're unfamiliar, is a change from healthy microbiome composition, usually triggered by environmental stressors, which will increase host susceptibility to disease. So here on the left, you can see that the NDMS and PCA suggest a difference in microbiome structure between treatments with the maroon close clusters are fish um, exposed to crude oil. And they found that when these fish were exposed to the crude oil that there was um, a significant abundance increase of mycobacterium ulcerans. So we know that these fish, their microbiome is changing and allowing for the increased abundance of mycobacteria. So um, Tyler Newburn was a former grad student in our lab and Matthew Scott, who you just heard from, um, they did an analysis of microbiomes of red drum in the Gulf of Mexico, and they found that 8% of red drum samples had mycobacterium detected with an increased abundance in fish with skin lesions. And they also found evidence of dysbiosis with gamma proteobacteria abundance decreasing when mycobacterium was increased because gamma proteobacteria tends to be the dominant phylum in fish dermal microbiome. So the um, the uh, fact that we saw that abundance decreasing with mycobacterium, mycobacterium increasing, that there is a change. And um, so, oh. but other factors affecting mycobacterium ulcerins um, presence is, could be inter, uh, environmental distribution and seasonal prevalence. So while when looking at environmental distribution, there was not a huge change, there was definitely um, NPM detected in higher abundance in water rather than biofilm. But when looking at uh, seasons, there was a significant effect of seasons on abundance of mycobacterium. So there was higher NPMs detected in winter uh, when compared to the other seasons with the lowest in the fall. But so far in these research, um, mycobacterium, the uh, genus was detected, but we have not seen the specific ecovars identified. So 
as Kayla said earlier about our NPM detection protocol, um, uh, I'll just give a little background that mycolactone is encoded on the bacterial plasmid and this detection protocol is what's is sequencing a portion of that plasmid, which allows us to detect the NPMs and define that specific ecovar. So Alex Rakestraw, a um, previous grad student in our lab, he um, went and collected different sample types around the southeastern United States and Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And these sites included uh, fresh and brackish water environments. And the different uh, sample types he collected were soil, water, biofilm, invertebrates, and what we are mainly focusing on, which is the fishes. And using SANE nets, they collected um, different fishes. Um, and they took the dermal mucosa to isolate the microbial DNA from the fish. And then using our PCR protocols, they detected the, um, if the fish had NPMs or not. And what they found was the NPM prevalence was less than 1% with only five total detections and two being Gambusia finis, two being Menidia, and one Elastoma zonatum. So while they did not find significant trends with what month was sampled, or the pH and dissolved oxygen in the water, or what species it was, or the fish diversity at the site. They did find an association with NPM and fish community at a site. So these red dots, um, uh, this is a principal component analysis. So the red dots show the NPM positive samples and the black or NPM negative. And if I can direct your attention to these on the left, these three, we see that at these, sites that Gambusia finis and Fungulus notatus were the most abundant. And what's interesting is that they're in the same order. And if I, we look at the last two positive samples, the three most abundant fish at this sample at the site are also all from the same order. So we're finding an association of NPM presence and the presence of the fish order, which establishes a role of fish community and detection probability. But one limitation of the sampling technique of standing from the shoreline with a net, we were unable to account for the role of large bodied fish as reservoirs for NPMs. So in my research of detecting mycobacterium ulcerans and red drum, um, we got our samples from the Alabama and the Mississippi deep sea fishing rodeos. Um, here is a chart of the fish species distribution of all the fish sampled. So what we did was take um, swabs of both the gills and cloacas of each fish. And we did this instead of taking the dermal um, mucosa because we were trying to um, avoid contamination from any anglers or anybody handling the fish. So when, um, after extracting the DNA and using our PCR protocols, we found so far that only 6.25% of red drum were, had mycobacterium ulcerans present. Um, so only two of the fish so far, but they both had um, mycobacterium present in both the gill and the cloaca. And um, this is a maximum likelihood phylogenetic tree made with our plasmid sequences we determine, and also that were some that were publicly available. So quickly, I'll go through the different ecovars so far we have. Um, this one here on the top is ecovar ulcerans. And this is the ecovar that causes burly ulcer in humans in the Eastern hemisphere. But we've also found it in uh, Gambusia finis and Menidia. Next is a novel ecotype we, I isolated from a red drum from the Gulf of Mexico. So while it's not part of a defined ecovar yet, what's interesting is that it's most closely related to the ecovars that are found in humans. Um, and the next ecovar is ecovar liflandii, and this was first thought to be uh, only found in frogs, but as you can see here, we found it in um, mosquito fish. And the next ecovar is kopaki, and so far this has only been found in fish in other parts of the world. Um, next ecovar is shinshuans, and this has only been found in humans in Japan, and ecovar um, Guianas, Guianas, and this has only been found in humans in South America and the French Guiana. And the last ecovar is ecovar Shudashatsii, and so far this ecovar has been found in uh, Gambusia finis, um, Cynops oscillatus, and Elastisonatum from our samples. 
But if I could point your attention to the two um, striped bass here, what's interesting is that one striped bass was uh, this Shida Satsi I was isolated from is from the Chesapeake Bay where the outbreak was. And the second one is a fish, a uh, striped bass caught from the Pearl River. And that's the first time we have isolated Shida Satsi from a, the same type of fish, um, but down here. So conclusions, there was um, low prevalence of NPMs present in fish in the Southeastern United States. Um, fish community influences NPM presence and possibly transmission. We isolated a novel mycobacterium ulcerans egotype from a red drum. And my, our future work uh, includes associations to look at associations between mycobacterium ulcerans presence and fish age groups and associations between specific ecobar presence and swab location and looking for NPM presence in other species as well. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge everybody who's helped on these projects and our funding. And yeah, any questions? Great, ha uh, great talk, Hannah. A um, very interesting project. Folks, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself or drop them in the chat. We've got a couple minutes. I guess I'm curious, um, what would be your guess of why those striped bass? So far apart, geographically, had the same um, same strain. That's a great question. I would say, of course, I can't say you know that it made its way down, but since we found it in other um, species of fish in the same area, like the red drum. Um, that it could be transmitted, since we don't know exactly the the way it's transmitted, it could be something to do with other fish having it and transmitting it to the striped bass. Um, that'd be somewhere I would go with. Yeah, that makes sense. And a question that just came into the chat from Matt Griffin, he's curious about, given the ubiquity of Gambusia and their ability to spread and colonize water bodies everywhere, you think they may play a role in the spread? of the SMICO? Yes, definitely. I think, um, I definitely think they, they all will play definitely a part in the trans, uh, transmission. Just definitely, we just wish we knew how. And also um, what's interesting is that, you know, it doesn't, they don't, the eco bars don't affect the fish the same way. Like some fish will have the skin lesions and many of the, the two red drum that I found with Shishasi, um, I didn't have lesions. So they're also very interesting how they're transmitted and then it affects the fish differently. Mm -hmm. I'll get back to the Zoom. <laughs> Nick, if you don't mind, I'll make a, one more comment adding to what Hannah just said. It was a great answer. Um, but both of these questions point to two different groups that are, uh, at least anecdotally in, in literature, seem to be predisposed to uh, carrying this bacteria. So uh, the, the septinodontiformes, which includes the Gambusia and their relatives, and then a group that's recently been named the Acanthuriformes, which includes the drums and striped bass. So um, I do think there's more work to do uh, regarding the phylogenetic effects on um, you know carrying this this particular bacteria, and we probably want to work with some veterinary groups so that we can actually have good sample sizes and get our statistical <laughs> a robust statistical comparison uh, in a controlled environment because you know, these environmental samples are just really hard to detect. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, thanks a lot for your presentation, Hannah, and good luck with veterinary school. Maybe you can come back to this project someday. And thanks everybody for 